Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. At that time, you may press star 1 to ask a question. Also, at this time, I would like to inform all parties that today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Irene I here. Thank you. You may begin. Hello, and welcome to today's FDA webinar. I am Irene Ihear of CDRH's Office of Communication and Education. Today's webinar will focus on the final order that requires manufacturers of automated external defibrillators, AEDs, to submit pre-market approval applications, PMAs, in order to market their products. This order applies to both the manufacturers of AEDs as well as those companies that manufacture accessories to these products. Today, Linda Ricci, from the Office of Device Evaluation here in CDRH will present an overview of the final order and clarify what it means for manufacturers. Linda's, following Linda's presentation, we will open the line for questions. To, for questions to assist Linda with the quick Q&A portion of other, our other subject matter experts from CDRH. Now I give you Linda. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Ritchie, and I work in the Office of Device Evaluation in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. Today's webinar is intended to provide an overview of the final order with a primary focus on what is expected as stated in the final order for manufacturers of these devices in terms of the timeline for submitting PMAs. Today's webinar will cover the following items. One, an overview of the final order. Two, a discussion of the timeline for submitting PMAs for new devices or new accessories. Three, a discussion of the timeline for submitting PMAs for AED devices that are currently distributed. Four, a discussion of the timeline for submitting PMAs for AED accessories that are currently distributed. And lastly, what we envision as the next step for manufacturers. The Food and Drug Administration is issuing a final order to require the filing of pre-market approval applications, or PMAs, for automated external defibrillator systems, which consists of an AED and those AED accessories necessary for the AED to detect and interpret an electrocardiogram and deliver an electrical shock. The final order can be found at the link provided on this slide. The order covers both the AED device itself and all accessories that are necessary for the AED to detect and interpret an electrocardiogram and deliver an electrical shock. Examples of these accessories include pad electrodes, batteries, adapters, and hardware keys for pediatric use. So what does the final order mean? Basically, it means that devices or accessories that have not received a 510K clearance will need to receive a PMA approval prior to beginning distribution. AED devices which have received a 510K clearance may continue to be distributed as long as the device is included in an intensive file and subsequent PMA within the time frame that will be discussed in the following slides. AED accessories that have received a 510K clearance may also continue to be distributed as long as they are included in a PMA within the time frame laid out in the order. Just to be clear, devices or accessories for which a 510K clearance was not issued must receive a PMA approval before the device can be legally marketed. So this applies to both the devices and the accessories. The intent of file is a mechanism by which a manufacturer of a currently marketed AED device can indicate to the agency which devices or device the manufacturer intends to include in the PMA. The manufacturer can continue to distribute devices that are included in an intent of file until the PMA is submitted, but no longer than 18 months. The intent of file must be formally submitted to the agency within 90 days from the date of the final order publication 
This would be around May 4th, 2015, and it must include a list of all devices, including model numbers and 510K numbers for which a PMA will be sought. Any currently marketed device, which is not included in the intent to file, must cease to be distributed as of May 4th, 2015. As a reminder, the intent to file is only needed for AED devices that are currently marketed. AED accessories do not need to have an intent to file. For AED devices that were identified in the intent to file, a PMA must be submitted within 18 months of the date of the final order, which would be uh, August 3, 2016. For devices included in the PMA, distribution can continue while the PMA is under review. I also want to note that multiple public access defibrillators may be submitted in a single PMA. Likewise, multiple professional use devices can also be submitted in a single PMA. And necessary AED accessories can also be included in either device PMA. If a notice to intent to file a PMA for a currently marketed AED device is not submitted within 90 days of the effective date of the final order or a PMA is not approved, then the manufacturer must cease distribution of the device or the device will be deemed to be adulterated and subject to seizure and condemnation. Moving to currently marketed AED accessories, if a necessary AED accessory is not included in a device PMA and that accessory is currently marketed, the PMA must be submitted within five years of the date of the final order. As with the currently marketed AED devices, distribution can continue while the PMA is under review. This table summarizes uh, the timeline for submission for AED devices and accessories that are currently marketed. So for the intent to file, AED devices have 90 days in which to submit an intent to file. Then the AEDs that are included in that intent to file can, be con can continue to be distributed for 18 months. AEDs that are not included in the intent to file may only be distributed for the next 90 days or until May 4th. For accessories, the intent to file is not applicable. The timeline for filing a PMA for AED devices that are currently on the market is within 18 months. And for accessories, it's within 60 months. And you may continue to distribute those devices that are included in a PMA until a not approvable decision or denial decision letter is issued. And of course, you can continue distribution if an approval order is issued. So next steps. For manufacturers, you need to file an intent to file for existing devices followed by PMA. It's important to remember that the intent to file is only for AED devices. For AED accessories that you intend to continue to market, you need to file a PMA within five years. For any new device or accessory that is not cleared through the 510K process, you need to file a PMA. We also strongly encourage all manufacturers to use a pre-submission process to obtain specific feedback from the agency. This can be with regards to your upcoming submissions or um, any questions that you have regarding uh, your current devices. For device users, we encourage you to continue to use, it, to use the devices as needed and continue to maintain your devices per the manufacturer's instructions. And now I can take your questions. Thank you. At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your touch tone phone. Please ensure your phone is unmuted and record your name clearly at the prompt. Once again, that is star one on your touch tone phone. It takes a few moments for the questions to come through. Please stand by.
Our first question comes from John Pardo. Go ahead. Your line is open. Yes, hello. I was wondering, uh, for devices that are in distribution now, under what paradigm PMA of 510K should manufacturers adhere to when making modifications, both before the PMA is submitted and during review? Uh, certainly. For, ma uh, for modifications to existing devices uh, during this transition period, uh, before uh, a PMA has been approved, um, it depends on the nature of the change. Uh, if there is a change that's needed due to part obsolescence or uh, due to a safety issue, the agency will work with you in order to make sure that uh, that change is implemented appropriately. In terms of new features that are being added to a device, those will need to be included in a PMA prior to um, market uh, distribution. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm showing no further questions at this time. Just one moment, please. We did have a few more questions come through. The next question comes from Matt Spencer. Go ahead. Your line is open. I was wanting to know if uh, manual defibrillators with an AED function are covered under this order. Yes. Any device that uh, has an AED function is covered under this order. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from Stuart Shulman. Go ahead, your line is open. Matt asked the question that I wanted to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by for the next question. Comes from Daryl Hughes. Go ahead, your line is open. Yes, that question's already been answered by, or asked and answered. Thanks. Thank you. One moment. The next question comes from John Pardo. Go ahead, your line is open. Thank you. Um, what additional data requirements, if any, will FDA impose to device functions which are not associated with AED functionality, such as a uh, monitoring function? So it is the intention of the agency to uh, look at things in the pre-market um, such that they support the intended use of the device in much the same way as we have them. Certainly for the AED functions, they need to uh, have a reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness, but we would not expect uh, any change to the, uh, say, monitoring functions or the ECG functions that currently exist on some of the monitor defibrillators. Uh, we would not expect that pre-market bar to, to be any different. As a follow-up question, may I ask one more question? Sure. Uh, we interpreted, we read the rule and interpreted to include accessories uh, associated with or necessary for the AED functionality and, ex and exclude accessories not necessary for the AED functionality. Is that interpretation correct? Yes, the accessories that are not necessary for the AED functionality may very well be covered under a different regulation, but they are certainly not part of this order. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Senthil Nakapan, go ahead, your line is open. Um, I think my question has been answered, but um, I probably, you know, I just, just by the prior person, I, mean, I probably want to give another example, like an accessory. I, I wouldn't call it as nice, like a cabinet that controls uh, uh, the temperature of the AED. How would you treat, I mean, which, which part it falls under, you know, um, like, like an example? So I would imagine that the uh, smart cabinets that control the AEDs uh, certainly, it's going to depend on the functionality that is included in that smart cabinet, but cabinets by themselves should not be covered under the final order. However, I would encourage you to uh, uh, send in a question to the agency with specific functionality um, for any specific uh, cabinet that, that might have um, additional capabilities uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm showing no further questions at this time. Thank you. This is Irene, I hear. We appreciate your participation and thoughtful questions.
seems like we have some more questions. Just one moment, please, for the next question. Coming from Beverly McGrain. Go ahead, your line is open. Yeah, hi. Um, this is Beth McGrain. Oh, so I was wondering, the rule talks about the accessories that will not be part of the PMA order. If we're adding a new non-PMA-related accessory functionality to the AED, are we going to have to have the 510K approved first and then do the PMA? So, I mean, there's there's a couple questions, I think, within your question. So let me take a stab at, at what uh, I believe your question to be. So if you have um, an accessory that would be covered under a separate regulation and could be cleared as a 510K under a separate regulation, would you need to get it cleared as a 510K prior to its incorporation into the AED? Uh, and my answer is some of that depends on uh, the, the business uh, aspect of, of what you're trying to do. Certainly, if you wanted that as a separate accessory with its own clearance, then you could take it through the 510K process. If, however, you were only going to use this with a um, AED, then uh, you would want to get that uh, approved through the PMA for use with the AED. Okay. So a follow-up question to that would be, um, if that's the case, is that accessory going to be held to the same PMA standards as the AED, or will it be held to the testing case standards? So in terms of the necessary data that we would want to see with regards to uh, demonstrating performance, the accessory that would otherwise be uh, 510K will be held to the 510K uh, performance bar. In as much as the accessory interacts with the AED and may impact the, um, the hazards or mitigations associated with that class three device, we would want to see that laid out. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Elaine Duncan. Go ahead, your line is open. Yes, um, you had mentioned that the pads may be uh, included in the PMA application. So if a pad manufacturer wanted their uh, device their pad to be included in an AED PMA, the pad manufacturer file this information with a device master file. Uh, and the second part of the question is, does the pad use with the AED require clinical data for use with that pad? So I'm going to start with the second part of the question because I think that one's a little bit more straightforward. Uh, the uh, information that we would expect for PADS with regards to demonstrating um, uh, 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 an assurance of safety and effectiveness uh, generally will not require um, clinical data, and we did discuss that um, in the final order and in some of the um, uh, questions in response to the final order or to the proposed order. Uh, generally speaking, um, there's good animal models and bench testing that can be done with PADS uh, to, to uh, provide the necessary performance data. As to your first question, um, if a manufacturer, if a PAD manufacturer would like to pursue uh, that way of, of getting their um, pads approved in a PMA, then, um, you know, certainly we are open to that discussion. Uh, and I would recommend that you coordinate with a uh, AED device manufacturer or and talk with the FDA about the specifics about how that uh, could be moved forward. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is going to come from Larry Starr. Go ahead, your line is open. Thank you. If for whatever reason an AED or its accessories do not receive PMA acceptance, 
is there any requirements to inform the users that this situation exists? So certainly we would want to um, the manufacturers to make aware certainly for devices that are that are currently market approved we would be interested in making sure that all of the devices that uh, were under that umbrella that are currently distributed um, uh, would everyone would know the, the status of that as to the exact regulatory actions that would we would take with regards to those devices, that would be something that um, we would have to look into and, and is a little bit beyond um, what I am prepared to discuss today. But um, I understand your question, and it's definitely something that um, we need to make sure that uh, uh, we're aware of going forward. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is from Daryl Hughes. Go ahead, your line is open. Thank you. To what extent does this order apply to distributors of recertified AEDs? As we discussed in um, the final order and the uh, questions and our responses to the questions that came as, as a response to the proposed order, refurbishers um, and resellers, if they meet the definition of a device manufacturer, would fall under this uh, final order. So if there is a refurbisher that is taking the devices and changing them in some way or fixing them and um, reselling them, then they would fall under this final order. And just to point to, I believe that was question 16 in the final order. Now, as a follow-up, I take that as long as there's not a change to the specs from the original uh, of how the AD was originally manufactured, there would not be a, um, a need for compliance with the PMA process by the recertified distributor, correct? Um, I think we there's uh, we need to be clear about what it means to be a um, refurbisher, and um, I would like to uh, uh, make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. Certainly, if you change the specification, it's very clear. If you're not changing the specification, but you're um, uh, fixing the device in, in any way, then I believe we also consider that a refurbisher and you would be subject to this order. Okay, thank you. And if you have any questions about whether the actions that um, uh, you are doing with regards to the device, then I would recommend that um, you come in and talk to us and we can be more specific about your specific case. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And again, as a reminder, if you do have a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Once again, that is star 1 if you have a question. Our next question will come from Kathy Roberts. Go ahead. Your line is open. I have a question about AEDs that are at, at user sites that are no longer being manufactured by the company. Will they need to be included in a PMA in order for us to continue selling the necessary accessories? They will not need to be included in the PMA for you to continue selling the necessary accessories for those devices. And that is one of the reasons that we allow the accessory manufacturers the extended five-year timetable for the PMAs so that uh, the situation that you're describing um, would be covered. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from John Pardo. Go ahead. Your line is open. Yes, is the, um, is the risk-based and over approach that was outlined recently in draft guidance on accessories, would that apply here? Uh, in terms of the accessories that were not um, identified in the final order, then um, certainly that draft guidance should be considered uh, when, when um, preparing submissions.
Thank you. And I'm showing no further questions at this time. One moment, please. Next question is from Greg Rubin. Go ahead, your line is open. With the new PMA submissions, will that drive a pre-PMA inspection for the manufacturer? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Samsil Nakapan. Go ahead, your line is open. Yeah, so I have a question based on the scenario. So um, um, say if uh, the accessories are, you know, might be applied for the accessories and it's been approved, and the same accessories could be uh, used on a new product, for example, uh, would we then require another PMA um, to be submitted with the new product PMA? So I'm going to rephrase your question just to make sure that um, I completely understand what you're asking. Sure. If you have a uh, an accessory that has been cleared through the 510K process and that same accessory without any changes is able to be used with a different product, uh, can that uh, 510K clearance still be used for the new product? Um, and I'm going to go back to uh, new accessory, uh, and, and any new accessories uh, would need to have a PMA approval prior to marketing. An existing accessory, which it sounds like what you're talking about, would uh, not need to have a PMA in-house um, for uh, five years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Elizabeth George. Go ahead. Your line is open. Uh, yes. Just to follow up on your comment about the accessories for non-presently selling defibrillators, you mentioned that's why you had the 60-month time frame, but in some cases that device may continue to be utilized well beyond the five years. So is the expectation that those accessories then be handled as a PMA, or does it go well beyond that 60-month time frame? I mean, we currently have uh, the uh, safeguard in place for the five years, and we certainly will reconsider um, as we get closer to that time frame about uh, the number of devices impacted and how we will proceed. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm showing no further questions at this time. Thank you. This is Irene I here. We appreciate your participation and thoughtful questions. Today's presentation, along with the slide presentation and transcript, will be available on, on the CDRH web, webinar page at www.fda.gov forward slash CDRH webinar by Friday, February 13th. If you have additional questions about this final order, please use the contact information provided at the end of the slide presentation. As always, we appreciate your feedback. Again, thank you for participating, and this concludes today's webinar.